So hi, everyone. Uh, happy Monday. Welcome back uh, for another round of the Shop Talks. For audiences that are new to us, we're maybe watching this later. I'm Elizabeth Rodini, the Andrew High School Arts Director here at the American Academy in Rome. And I'm very happy to be introducing tonight's speakers. Uh, as per usual, we pair a scholar with an artist and I'll introduce both of them now and we will take questions at the end after each of them has spoken. And first up will be Dylan Gish, who holds the Arthur Ross Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Rome Prize. Dylan is a PhD candidate in classical art and archaeology at Stanford University, from which he holds an MA in anthropology with a focus on heritage ethics. He graduated summa cum laude with a BA in art history and classical studies from the University of Washington in 2013. Dylan has a, a fabulously wide ranging CV. There's so many things that interest me on his CV that it's hard to decide what to focus on. But to give you a sense of it, he has excavated at COSA, our affiliated archeological site. He participated in the 2017 seminar on the art historical image in the digital age here at the AAR. He has been a researcher and project manager for Stanford's Egypt in South Africa Digital Humanities Project. He co-organized a conference, Museums, Memory, and Media for Stanford and the Isico Museums in Cape Town. He has taught courses, including one pertinent to our most recent walk titled Secret Lives of Statues from Ancient Egypt to Confederate Monuments. And he has co-curated exhibitions on German expressionism, Japanese color woodblocks, and Audubon's birds and quadrupeds of North America. He's also admirably active in Stanford student government and a number of professional organizations. And I know he is staying on top of all of this, even from Rome, thanks or maybe not to Zoom, right, Dylan? The title of Dylan's talk is Rehabilitating the Modest Venus Replica Series or Legacy Data and the Imperative to Interpret. Our second speaker will be, will be William Doherty, a composer who holds the Luciano Berio Rome Prize. Bill graduated with a bachelor's degree in music composition from Temple University, and he earned a master's degree as a Marshall Scholar from the Royal College of Music in London. He's also studied at the Hochschule für Musik in Basel, Switzerland, and at the IRCAM in Paris. He is currently completing his doctorate of musical arts degree at Columbia University. Bill's work has been performed internationally from Paris to London to Darmstadt to Tallinn in Estonia and soon in Rome. And this is part of our May 20th concert at the Villa Aurelia. So I put in a small plug for that. And he has received awards and recognitions from many sources, including the Aaron Copeland House and the American Composers Forum. He is a regular contributor to feature music programs on WKCR FM New York and contributes to many journals and magazines. Currently, he is guest co-editing a forthcoming issue of Contemporary Music Review on the music of Eliane Radig, who is also the subject of his dissertation. In the spring of 2020, as a teaching scholar of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Columbia, Bill designed and taught a really interesting sounding course called Reimagining Resistance, Sound as Subversion in 20th and 21st Century American Experimentalism. Outside of the university, he gives private lessons and volunteers as a music instructor and mentor for high school and elementary school students from underserved communities in New York City. Bill's talk is titled Music and the Collective Awareness. But first, we turn to Dylan Gish on rehabilitating the modest Venus. Dylan. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. I'd like to begin tonight by thanking the American Academy in Rome for the opportunity to write my dissertation among such incredible community. I'd also like to thank the community here directly. You have all been uh, exceptional colleagues so far and I'm so looking forward to continuing to learn and see new things with all of you in the coming months. The object matter of my dissertation is the so-called Modest Venus replica series, some examples of which I'm showing you on screen now. The images show the goddess naked and covering her vulva. 
I use the term modest Venus as a kind of shorthand for a group of idealized goddesses, including Greek Aphrodite and Roman Venus, as well as other associated deities, including Etruscan Turan, Egyptian Isis, and Phoenician Astarte. While there are important distinctions among these goddesses for my project's purposes, I consider them to be distinctions largely without a difference. This is because ancient polytheistic religions of which these, de of which these deities were a part were predicated on correct ritual action rather than orthodox belief. Consequently, ancient polytheistic persons often erred on the side of being inclusive rather than exclusive when venerating and representing the gods, and I take my cue from them. Images of modest Venus occur in a bewildering variety of sizes, shapes, and materials. Some of these images are well-crafted, many are not. Some represent modest Venus in, a, in an aesthetically pleasing and erotically alluring manner, many do not. <laughs> In fact, quite a few fly utterly in the face of any Winkelmanian notions we may have of the noble simplicity and quiet grandeur of ancient art. In sum, images of modest Venus are a big tent group and I want to understand them as such. However, for historiographic reasons, to understand images of modest Venus, we must take a brief tour to the Canadian Aphrodite first. Around 350 BCE, the Athenian sculptor Praxiteles sculpted a group, uh, sculpted a statue of Aphrodite. The community of Knidos in southwestern Anatolia acquired the statue and it remained in Knidos until the early 5th century CE when Lausus, a high-ranking functionary in the court of the Eastern Roman Emperor, had it moved to his palace in Constantinople. In 475, a fire destroyed Lausus' palace and the Canadian Aphrodite with it. All that remains of this statue are the more than 500 surviving ancient Roman images of modest Venus that, appear to, that it appears to have inspired. Among all these images of modest Venus, scholars have singled out this statue as the single quote unquote most faithful copy by which they mean the one that they judge to most closely approximate the form of the ancient Canadian Aphrodite and Praxiteles own style. For this reason, they chose a large aesthetically pleasing marble statue to function as a surrogate for the now lost Canadian Aphrodite. This single statue of modest Venus is emblematic of the two reasons why historians of art have primarily studied the modest Venus replica series. First, historians of ancient art have compared surviving images of modest Venus against one another to reconstruct Praxiteles' masculine artistic genius and the form of his greatest feminine masterpiece, the Canadian Aphrodite. This practice is very much in keeping with the Vizarian methodology of writing the history of art as a series of biographies of artistic geniuses working in the so-called major arts, including painting, sculpture, and architecture. In this vein, images of modest Venus are a means to an end and those that correspond to our assumptions about the Canadian Aphrodite tend to be held in highest esteem. It is perhaps not surprising then that historians of art have valued certain kinds of modest Venus images above, above others. Like the Venus Colonna, these images are generally large, aesthetically pleasing marble statues that have been in the collections of elite families and venerable institutions since the early modern period. The Venus Colonna, the Venus Capitolina, and the Venus de Medici, which I show you on screen, are especially striking examples of the kinds of images that this methodology elevates above others. Meanwhile, images with divergent materialities or visualities or latecomers to the scene have been relegated to the dark corners of museum storerooms. Nevertheless, art historians continue to catalog this ever-expanding corpus of modest Venus images with a positivist epistemological framework as if the more replicas cataloged, the greater the resolution with which they might reconstruct the Canadian Aphrodite. Second, the Canadian Aphrodite has acquired a reputation as the first known monumental representation of a naked woman in Western art. I am of the mind that we can substantiate no such claim. However, this claim's very existence tells us something about how modern scholars have understood the Canadian Aphrodite and by extension, why they have studied the modest Venus images. My dissertation pushes back against these approaches. Surviving evidence suggests that the ancient production and consumption of images of modest Venus was a massive phenomenon. It appears to have spanned the entire spatial extent of the ancient Roman world from Spain in the West to Iraq in the East, from Britain in the North to Upper Egypt in the South. Likewise, it begins as early as the second century BCE and continues intermittently for the next 300 years. At this point, the overall quantity of images of modest Venus produced booms, and this boom lasts for approximately uh, a century, at which point the Roman Empire crumbles. <laughs> um, the images of modest Venus continue intermittently, perhaps lasting as long uh, as into the fifth century CE, 
Um, and ultimately, the sort of fate of the Modest Venus replica series remains largely unknown. We don't really study this period very well. I find the bigness and messiness of this phenomenon fascinating. And in my dissertation, I consider how specific groups of images of Modest Venus would have been contextually meaningful to ancient viewers and how they relate to the overarching Modest Venus phenomenon. Tonight, however, I want to turn my attention from ancient images of Modest Venus to the 19th and 20th century catalogs through which art historians locate and study them. The reason for this is simple. The longer I study this archive of catalogs, the more disturbed I become by what I see. To understand how art historians have cataloged images of Modest Venus, we first need to understand how they have cataloged images of Aphrodite and Venus more broadly. To do this, we need to perform a close visual analysis of catalogs and close readings of catalog entries that have generated this corpus. Here I show you a two page spread excerpted from Bernoulli's late 19th century typology of Aphrodite images. While this typology is old, as I will show you, it undergirds all attempts to catalog Aphrodite and Venuses up to the present day. While this excerpt is in German, I believe that the formal choices in the table of content should be sufficient to convey my present purposes. Please bear with me. <laughs> Bernoulli's typology is linear and hierarchically arranged under a series of nested headings. First, we encounter the highest order category of Bernoulli's overall organizational scheme, a combination of style and periodization. In this case, we have the perfected style or fully realized style, which broadly corresponds to the classical period of ancient Greek art, conventionally lasting from roughly 500 to 323 BCE. Next, we see second order categories, in this case, degree of nudity. Uh, we move from the clothed images at top to half clothed images at center um, to unclothed images of Aphrodite at bottom, which Bernoulli names in a euphemistic fashion. Then we find third order, more narrowly defined formal categories. For images of Aphrodite, these are image types, a fraught concept according to which the best image of a given set of formal features stands in for a group of images, which are more or less interchangeable. Finally, we encounter the fourth order heading where descriptions and illustrations of individual images reside. Bernoulli created this typology in the 19th century. Its original intention was to catalog images of Aphrodite and art historians have continued to use it for this purpose in the intervening 150 years. During this time, the number and variety of images of particular types, including the modest Venus have increased by one or more orders of magnitude However, Bernoulli's typology has remained more or less unchanged. Here I show you two excerpts of tables of contents from the catalogs of the Lexicon Iconographica Mythologiae Classicae, an encyclopedic collection of catalogs of images of modest of mythological figures in ancient art, which I will refer to as Limk from here on out. Specifically, I'm showing you the table of contents of two of the seven known Limk catalogs that contain images of modest Venus. Be, uh, Aphrodite on the left and Venus on the right, which respectively date to 1984 and 1997, respectively. Here we can see the tables of contents reproduce and further develop Bernoulli's typology. On the right, I've highlighted the catalogers use of Bernoulli's second order categories, clothed, half clothed and unclothed. And in the center, I've highlighted both catalogers uses of Bernoulli's third order categories. In this case, the Canidian, Capitoline and Medici types. And I've illustrated the type objects for each. Uh, here, we're sort of diving down actually into the Aphrodite um, catalog itself, and we can see uh, the suite of images that the author has used to illustrate the Canadian type. We begin at the bottom left with the Venus Colonna, which art historians have decided is the most faithful surviving copy of the now lost Canadian Aphrodite, as I mentioned previously. Uh, a sequence of statue fragments follows. First decapitated bodies, then disembodied heads, stone statuettes, a stone relief. <laughs> bronze statuettes, and ultimately a bronze coin. We eventually encounter the Venus Capitolina in the bottom right, and the process starts all over again for the Capitoline type. Just as Bernoulli composed his table of contents to communicate an overarching evolutionary macro logic, an organizational principle also governs the order in which illustration occurs. However, this time, the micro logic is one of fragmentation, deformation, and devolution. First, we find the life-size stone statues, which most clo closely approximate the Canadian Aphrodite's materiality and visuality, followed by miniature stone statuettes, sculpted stone reliefs, so on and so forth, um, through bronze statuettes um, and into bronze reliefs. Implicit in this arrangement is a judgment that each sequential entry is less faithful than the previous. 
And this arrangement then proliferates across other types of images of modest Venus, including the Capitoline type and the Medici type sequentially. From this exercise comes my first observation. Catalogers of images of modest Venus construct their catalogs according to a series of subjective aesthetic judgments, which they present as a series of objective observations. Sometimes these judgments are implicit as in what I have just shown you. Other times they're quite explicit. For example, writing in 1981, Marie-Odile Jean-Pierre snubbed an entire group of Syrian bronze statuettes of modest Venus that she was cataloging. She wrote, and I quote, the title of my paper, that is some aspects of Aphrodite in Egypt and Syria in the Hellenistic and Roman periods, might lead you to believe that I'm going to show you some of the most seductive representations of the goddess of beauty dressed in oriental fashion. However, do not delude yourselves too much. The Aphrodites that I'm about to show you, if they're not exactly repulsive, are by no means prize-winning beauties if we refer to the canons of Greek art. From this quote, it's possible to perceive an additional reason why catalogers use aesthetic judgments to organize a corpus. By elevating some images and demoting others, the cataloger can showcase their own good taste and lay claim to objective expertise in what might otherwise be an all too subjective enterprise. However, as this quote vividly demonstrates, when the author's performance of good taste is transposed into the quote unquote orient, it rapidly takes on connotations of gendered and raised epistemic violence directed against West Asian bodies. As the corpus of images of modest Venus has continued to grow, it is not from ancient metropoles such as Roman Athens that the greatest number of new discoveries have come. It is often from places that, like Syria, are perceived to have been marginal in the ancient Roman world and remain uh, at the margins of the modern West today. This brings me to my second observation. Catalogs of images of modest Venus routinely make decisions about which images to include and which to exclude based on implicit or not so implicit biases. On the surface, this seems perfectly reasonable. A catalog cannot do everything and massive international cataloging endeavors like LIMC are expensive and need to economize somewhere. For this reason, catalogers must do triage when deciding which images to include and which to exclude and how much space each entry merits. Quite often, the logic by which catalogers curate and illustrate their catalogs derives from exactly the slippage between subjective judgment and objective description that I've laid out above. For example, the same author I just discussed, the quote, also cataloged images of Aphrodite, quote unquote, in the Oriental periphery, a problematic concept, as I've mentioned, in Limk only three years after she published the catalog containing the previous quote. Strikingly, her second catalog excludes the very group of bronze statuettes of Aphrodite from Egypt and Syria that she had previously described in exactly those terms. When this group of images finally did appear in Limk, they were buried. <laughs> they were buried in a catalog of images of Isis and in such a condensed format that they were uh, indecipherable to me, who spends most of my life up to my eyeballs in catalogs. Here we see this eventual entry in Lim's catalog of Isis images. The seven images in question have been cataloged under a single two-line heading in the form of a schematic description. Three images receive additional comments that qualify or revise the heading's claims. The next, get a three, the next gets a three-word note on her hairstyle. The next two receive no comments at all. And the final statuette is described simply as forearms missing. Taken together, three impressions emerge from reading this catalog entry. First, these hybrid images have been judged to be insufficiently classical to qualify as proper modest Venus images. Second, the catalog has judged these images to be of insufficient quality or interest to be illustrated. And third, the sum total of what these images have to offer does not merit description, let alone interpretation. To put this in perspective, this group of images was not only shunted to an article where no one would reasonably expect to find images of modest Venus, this entire group of images received less space in the LIMP catalog of Isis images than an entry for a single disembodied head in the LIMP catalog of Aphrodite images. What's more, the entry for Praxiteles lost Canadian Aphrodite, which does not survive, is roughly six times the length of each of these. One might reasonably ask whether this is an isolated incident. Unfortunately, no. Under the LIMP entry for Turan, the Etruscan analog of Greek Aphrodite and Roman Venus, there is a description for an alabaster Voltaire incinerary urn in which a modest Venus interposes herself between Paris, the Trojan prince who absconded with Helen and started the Trojan War, and Deifubus, another Trojan prince. The cataloger describes the urn's composition as follows, quote, Turan, winged with a diadem and necklace, naked under a mantle, protects pa Paris seeking sanctuary from Deifubus who threatens him at the altar of Zeus. 
at right, Alasa, this is a minor Etruscan divinity, places her hand on Paris's shoulder. 42 urns illustrate this theme, and then um, a citation. Uh, the number of protagonists and the bearing of Turin varies from urn to urn, end quote. This verbal description's brevity stands in stark contrast to the attention and space lavished on the verbal and visual descriptions of the more highly esteemed bronze mirrors above. As with the previously mentioned group of Syrian statuettes of Modest Venus from Lynx Isis catalog, the author of Lynx Turan catalog initially suggests that this group of urns are functionally interchangeable. However, he then reverses course and notes not only that different urns have different numbers of figures, but that the dispositions of those figures vary. Here I show you a photograph that I have uh, taken of this urn um, uh, that the author used as a stand-in for this entire group. To be clear, cinerary urns are definitionally urns meant to house cremated human remains. Like this urn, most of these feature variations on this composition, uh, featuring variations on this composition, are surmounted by surviving lids sculpted into reclining figures, possibly portrait statues, and quite a lot of these lids have legible Etruscan and Latin inscriptions that name the person whose remains they would have once held. It should go without saying that these urns are therefore in no way functionally interchangeable with one another. They are only rendered so by catalogers who have purposively cropped the names and faces of once living persons whose remains these urns would once have held out of their catalogs. Viewed in this light, Etrus the Etruscan cinerary urns are a particularly egregious example of how catalogers have flattened and otherwise distorted the corpus of images of Modest Venus. Because art historians have been so intent on reconstructing a now lost statue, they have failed to attend to the variety of contexts from which surviving images of Modest Venus come. And as a result, they have either told harmful stories or done harm by preventing stories from coming into existence at all. I say this not to point fingers, that's not the purpose here today. I say this in the hope that I and future people who work on these images might find a more productive and equitable and inclusive way of telling stories about people and things in the past. We come at last to my third and final observation about the study of images of Modest Venus. The quantity of cataloged images of Modest Venus has grown by two orders of magnitude since the 19th century. However, Neither the methodology that catalogers employ to describe them, nor the interpretations that they generate have changed substantively in this time. Studies of science and technology have demonstrated that both the person and the apparatus investigating a phenomenon are inextricable from how they describe and interpret it. However, neither a diversifying community of practice nor a more densely populated typology have altered our perceptions of the corpus of images of modest Venus. All roads lead back to the Canadian Aphrodite. As I've already argued, I believe that this is because catalogers of images of Modest Venus are not actually describing, let alone interpreting these images. Rather, catalogers have been so intent on looking for the Canadian Aphrodite that they have utterly failed to see images of Modest Venus and the people entangled with them as worthy of study in and of themselves. This brings us full circle. I can only conclude that the insidious logic of typological catalogs that I have laid out tonight is a feature and not a bug of this methodology. It is a formidable challenge to document how implicit biases have fundamentally warped the study of images of Modest Venus in insidious and harmful ways. The observations I have made tonight are small and plausible deniability is omnipresent. Yet the more I have worked on this material, the more convinced I am that the entire edifice that scholars have constructed to catalog the Modest Venus replica series over the past two centuries is fundamentally compromised and needs to be rehabilitated. Now, uh, we should be careful here. I uh, wish neither to sort of equate epistemic violence with embodied violence, uh, nor to imply that my dissertation stakes are on par with other attempts to pursue gendered and race equity. Uh, nevertheless, what I have encountered during my project suggests that the time has come to relinquish our nostalgia for a Canadian Aphrodite that never was and find a new methodology for describing and interpreting so-called images of Modest Venus. My dissertation is one experimental attempt to do just this. Rather than producing a hierarchically organized catalog of images ordered according to injurious notions of fidelity to a lost original, I generate a heterarchical database that continually sorts and resorts with no beginning and no end. Rather than producing qualitatively and quantitatively variable prose descriptions, I produce standardized image metadata, which I can then use to study these images as a broad phenomenon or in subgroups. Rather than including and excluding images according to type or cultural historical identifications, Excuse me. I include all images that meet my diagnostic criteria. This is a big tent phenomenon. 
I do all of this in service of writing interpretive and, and contextualized micro art histories of these groups of images, which are among the most marginalized that I have found in this corpus. This includes both the Syrian statuettes and the Etruscan cinerary urns that I have mentioned tonight, as well as a group of approximately 60 ancient Roman provincial bronze coin series from Western Anatolia and Southeast Bulgaria that I have not discussed. Uh, are these silver bullets to fixing this problem? Surely not, um, but I assert that they are solid first steps towards rehabilitating the study of images of modest Venus. Since the 1980s, scholars have replicated ancient sculpture, including many who have spent time working at the American Academy in Rome, have demonstrated that there is much to be learned by reorienting the study of the so-called Roman copies after Greek originals, away from hunts for a lost original and towards how images that look similar might have nevertheless led quite different lives in their own times and places. When I began my project, I saw myself following in their footsteps by bringing this line of analysis to bear on images of modest Venus. Indeed, this is a large portion of what my dissertation does, and this will likely end up being what classical art history, the field in which I work, views as my dissertation's primary contribution. However, my project has also taken on a second life that largely lies beyond the scope of classical art history. In this second life, I examined these 19th, 19th and 20th century catalogs as an archive in their own right to uncover the pernicious ways that catalogers, images of modest Venus have denied images and people the right to have their stories told. I presented some of this work in vignettes tonight, and the more I work on this other dissertation, <laughs> the more that this strikes me as what I hope will someday re be regarded as my dissertation's top line contribution. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Dylan. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of comments from the many classicists and art historians we have in our midst. Um, but now I want to uh, turn this over to Bill, Bill Doherty. All righty, let's see here. Let's get this going. All right, assuming you can all see this. All right. Let me see. Okay, so thank you to the American Academy in Rome for cultivating this space. Thank you to Elizabeth for hosting. Thank you to Dylan for the inspiring critique of classical taxonomies. I think somehow miraculously, we may find there to be many more affinities between our talks than we had originally imagined. <laughs> and thank you to everyone here for engaging with what I'm about to talk about. I'm really looking forward to our discussions about some of the topics and questions that I'll raise in this talk. We all interact with music in our lives in one way or another. So all of you have something valuable to offer the conversation, even if you only consider yourself to be a listener. So my talk will be in three big parts. The first part, I will discuss some of my sonic interests and illustrate how these sonic interests manifest in my music. That will be the biggest part. The second part will be some recent scholarship I've been doing and some big questions that have emerged from that scholarship. And then in the third part, I'll talk about what I'm doing here. Not what am I doing here, but the, the projects I'll be undertaking. Uh, but before, I just wanna give a little preface before jumping in. A through line that runs through all of my recent music is the question, what is the material of music? Where does the music lie? Is it in the notes and rhythms on the page? Is it in the sounds of a concert performance? Or perhaps it's in a recording of a specific concert performance. Or maybe, as many Western composers believe, the material of the music is the themes, the motives, the melodies, the rhythms, the harmonies, the textures that the composer imagines in their head. In my recent music, I've been asking what it would mean to reimagine normative ways of thinking about the material of music. What if by shifting our perspectives, the material of music could transcend these otherwise potentially limiting ontologies? How can a shift in thinking about music's material point us towards a more vast and inclusive creative practice, one that is more open, equitable, collaborative, and community oriented? How might our concept of music's material shape the way that we interact with other people, with sounds, with objects, with traditions, and how might this impact how we, you and I, interact with one another and the world around us? So jumping in to part one, my sonic interests. At the core of my creative work is a, fasc a fascination with what I like to call the inner life of sound. 
This is the fluctuation of layers of flashing rhythms of momentum of energy and irregular noise elements that provide sounds their particular and often intangible sense of sonority. I believe that by reconfiguring our listening, we can uncover overlooked beauty in the world around us. Some of you might remember my five minute talk when I talked about Katie Payne's discovery of elephant infrasound. For those of you who don't remember, as it turns out, elephants are communicating with one another quite beautifully, I might add, at frequency levels which are below our range of hearing. And I find that to be hugely inspiring. But let's turn this search for the inner life of sound to an audio recording. We're gonna to listen to an excerpt from my favorite recording of Mozart's String Quartet Number no. 14 by the Alban Berg Quartet recorded in 1989. This is the beginning of the fourth movement. At around 24 seconds, there's this amazing squeak from the bow of one of the members of the string quartet. Bowed strings are pretty miraculous in how they work. Little bits of horse hair are drawn across the string and as they're drawn across the string, they catch the string and cause the string to vibrate back and forth. As the string vibrates back and forth, it's also catching again and again. So it's really a whole world of complex and unpredictable vibrations. So of course, you know, sometimes there's amazing extra sounds. So pay attention to 24 seconds. I'll play the whole first bit up to there. It was subtle, so I isolated it and I'm going to play it for you again. You hear, you hear that little squeak? But let me take you a little further, just for a second. Let me take you into my ears and my head. What if I were to stretch this moment out to live in this wild inner fluctuations for a bit longer? It might sound something like this. Oops, darn, I'm gonna do it again. So you can hear there's a whole world of sound and fluctuations in there. But the question is, how can I encourage you, the listeners, to tap into this inner life of sound without using just simple cheap tricks like this? One of the methods I use is sonic immersion. The idea is if listeners can feel the sound, then they can more readily perceive its inner components literally. I wrote a piece called That Feeling in the Pit of Your Stomach is Real. Just to give you a little bit of context, the piece was written when our then president uh, was threatening nuclear war with North Korea. Uh, the piece is for an air raid siren with uh, two trombones and speakers which are playing electronic tones. The air raid siren is controlled using a voltage controller that I sort of jerry-rigged so that I could turn up the speed of the air raid siren gradually and so that then the pitch would slowly glide up. Um, the trombonists are also starting on the outside of the room and towards they move towards the center where the air raid siren is on a table with light shining up at the air raid siren. So we're gonna to listen to a little excerpt of this. This is the end of the piece. You can see the two trombonists there. Um, also notice people are plugging their ears. This is very, very, very loud. I provided everyone with earplugs. Some people like my friend here, John Rott, did not take the advice, so they're plugging their, their ears. Um, it won't be that loud for you. Obviously, it'll be coming out of your speakers on your computer, but let's play, let's play some imagination here.
Sorry, the slow fade out. Okay, another technique that I've used to uh, uh, encourage listeners to listen within the sound is to treat psychoacoustic phenomenon as musical material. And I'll explain exactly what I mean by that right now. Um, we hear sounds and we process them in our brains in certain ways. There are certain peculiarities about the way we process sound. For example, when there are two frequencies that are the same uh, pitch or the same frequency, when they move slightly apart, we start to perceive an, a, a rhythm out of that um, out of those two tones. And it's just simply a matter of acoustics, but um, it's where you can see this wonderful GIF showing you this green and red. Uh, the green and red are two frequencies. Basically, they're when they line up, they're creating constructive waves. And when they're, uh, when they're not lining up, they're canceling each other out. And so what we end up perceiving is actually rhythm coming out of two tones, which are slightly different. I'm gonna play a little example of this uh, for you. It's called beating. Um, uh, it's gonna be two sign tones, so very pure tones, so that you can hear it very clearly. One is gonna stay the same, one is gonna sl slowly go up, and what you're gonna hear is a rhythm starting to emerge and go faster and faster. Okay, this is all over music. This is in the Mozart. It's just we're not focusing on it because we're focusing on the melodies and how they're developing or the harmonies or the squeaks that are coming out of the strings. So my idea was, why don't I write a piece where the rhythms are built from the beating, a psychoacoustic phenomena, and that is the material of the music. So the, the performers themselves are listening to an electronics part, which is putting out these tones and they're slowly gliding and creating these rhythms. And what if the ensemble were to play with those rhythms to bring your ear into the sound? Well, this is an excerpt of my piece Intersections, which does exactly that. Okay. Another technique I use to so draw listeners into the sound is to reduce, reduce, reduce. The idea is if I eliminate from the musical texture elements that you might usually latch on to be the material of the music, so reduce the melodies, reduce the gestures, reduce the harmonic progressions, then it may encourage you to listen for something else. This is a passage from a uh, fugue of Bach from the Well-Tempered Clavier that I was practicing. Um, it's a very fast uh, uh, passage, and I was practicing it as all performers do very slowly, especially if you wanna get it to go fast. Ironically, you practice it very slow. So let me just play this excerpt. This is an excerpt of someone far better at harpsichord playing it than me. So as I was practicing this very slowly, this passage, um, I was actually practicing it on a keyboard. I set the keyboard to the organ voice so I could hear the sustaining sound. And I was practicing it so slowly and listening and going, there is such magic, such inner life in this passage, but it blows by us in most recordings in two seconds. Well, 20 seconds. What if I were to stretch this out to, let's say, 13 minutes so that you could really focus on the magic that's happening within the sound as it slowly evolves. This piece is called A Stillness of Zero Sensation and it is based entirely off of that passage. It's the same exact notes, um, except that they are blurring together.
So I, I didn't, I realized I didn't explain this. This is just a sketch and you can see there's time codes above where I was mapping out. It's literally just time stretched. Okay, another uh, thing that has been interesting me recently is exploring the notion of the recording as musical material. Most, to, most composers today only hear their compositions live once or twice due to cultural and economic frameworks of the classical music marketplace. As a result, the vast majority of people in the world who have experienced my music have done so through recordings, not live performances. And of course, this raises a lot of interesting questions about recording technology and musical material. For example, what do recordings capture and what do they fail to capture? Are they capturing the music or are we hearing technology's limitations and cultural belief systems? After all, how we record and what we record says an enormous amount about what we believe music to be. It's certainly not the coughing of the audience, for example. It's certainly not the breathing of the person next to you. Interestingly, in early recordings, you can hardly hear what today is often considered the material of music due to technological limitations. The most tangible element in the sound is often the technology itself, which really puts into relief this fact that recordings are and will always be cultural technological constructions, not accurate windows into space and time. Um, in 2019, I wrote a piece uh, using a recording from a wax cylinder. Here you can see an Edison wax cylinder, um, a wonderful aspect about wax cylinders, it's sort of beautiful and poetic, is that when you once they're recorded on, when they're played back, it wears them away. Every time you play it back, it, it creates more and more distortion and the material you were supposed to be recording disappears. Uh, so I used an 1888 wax cylinder recording of Handel's Oratorio, Israel and Egypt, which was recorded in London with this massive orchestra and massive choir. Um, and of course it raises the, the question of what does the recording actually capture? Here is the sound of the wax cylinder. And I just love that. I love the choirs and the distance and the, the technology just. Anyway, so I wrote this piece um, that uses this recording, inspired by this recording, built around this recording. It's called Soft Brown Wax. Let's listen to a bit. So part two, research and big questions. So my dissertation is on the music of Elian Radig. In the 1950s, uh, well, first off, Elian Radig is a living composer uh, based in Paris. Uh, she's in her 80s. In the 1950s, Elian worked in the earliest electronic music studios in France alongside music concrete pioneers like Pierre Schaeffer. There she's 
There's Eliane Radig looking bored by Pierre Schaeffer. She then decided to go her own way and started writing synthesizer music, compositions of long durations and radically sustaining sounds full of rich inner fluctuations. She composed alone for 30 years in her living room of her Paris apartment where she had this synthesizer. She received very little recognition, uh, especially from the French uh, music scene for her, um, for her work. In 2001, she started writing compositions for and with instrumentalists. It's kind of like mind blowing. After 30 years of these like really long synthesizer pieces, she started working with instrumentalists. And this is where my dissertation starts. The way that she composes for instrumentalists has raised more questions about the material of music. To give you a little background on her creative practice, she collaborates with musicians. They come to her apartment in Paris. They talk about life. They drink tea. They, their working together is punctuated by meals, hanging out, talking about family. Um, instrumentalists get in touch with her through other instrumentalists. So there's no like, there's no publisher to contact. There's no sort of like website you can go to to get in touch with Elian Radig. There's no score. So her whole life, she didn't use a score because she was making synthesizer music and she maintained that way of working. It's an image-based way of composing. They talk about an image that structures the music. Radig works as a facilitator, not an authority. They create music together um, in tandem. It's a time intensive process. It's not deadline driven, it's not commission driven, and it's not market driven. Sometimes these, these collaborations take weeks, sometimes years. Of course, the sounds differ significantly from performance to performance because there is no written score. And so there's this wonderful idea of living scores that the, the music is constantly evolving. And here's the most interesting bit for me. It's this idea that instead, because there is no score, it is the responsibility of the performers to transmit the piece to other performers. So you can only learn one of these pieces if you get in contact with one of the performers who has already performed this music. The question then is, well, what are the instrumentalists transmitting when they teach the musical material to someone else? And my dissertation is uh, over 20 interviews with performers who have worked with her. Most have responded, it's a way of listening and responding. It's the process of learning the music that they're teaching. It's the ways of relating to and interacting with sound and one another. These are the most important aspects. So many of the performers have said, I need to, if someone comes to me, we need to do the same process that we did with Elian. Drink tea, hang out, talk about life, work through these things slowly. So then back to this question, what is the material of music? What if the material of music was the communities it builds, the subjectivities it creates, the communication flows it constructs, the social orders it facilitates, the processes of making, performing, and experiencing music? What if we decouple musical material from sounds, from objects, and connect it to networks of people, institutions, and discourses? Can a creative practice and the social orders it builds be the material of the music? Part three, what now? This is where you all come in and this is where community comes in. This is one of the projects I'm most excited about here at the American Academy. It's a piece called In Dark Times Will There Also Be Singing? The title is borrowed from Bertolt Brecht's poem. Uh, you can see it there, In the Dark Times Will There Also Be Singing? Yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. He wrote this uh, when he was in Denmark fleeing Germany. Um, the idea of the piece is this is a little hut in Villa Shara. Um, over the course of a week, um, passersby, you included, will be welcomed into this space where you will be uh, prompted with this, uh, this title um, and you will be asked to sing, hum, or whistle a tune, a melody that brings you joy. When you push a pedal, you'll be recorded and it will record it. When you let go, someone else's melody will play back to you 
who has been there before you. And so in a way you're having an intimate connection with someone through sound that is otherwise not possible in this time during this pandemic uh, because literally choirs are not singing anymore um, in this time. And so really what I wanna say is turning, turning the focus to people, to community, to making music through collaboration um, is what is most interesting me, me right now. And I hope that you will join me, my community right now, my community in Rome on this journey. Um, I will, I'll definitely post things about this on Janet and bother you all with lots of emails. Um, so thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Bill. That was terrific. Um, and Dylan, yeah, I mean, amazing, the connections that you uh, brought to life. I know we're going to have a great discussion, but first I have to thank Bill for giving me permission to make a lot of squeaky noises when I rehearsed with my quartet. Now I can call them amazing extra sounds, not mistakes. So exactly. thanks, I appreciate that. Um, we're going to use uh, the raised hand feature for questions, which just seemed to work pretty well. I suspect there are going to be a lot of those. And Rebecca Messbarger, I think, had her hand up first. So Rebecca, please go ahead and unmute yourself. OK. Hey, guys. I, I just love those two talks. They're sort of mind blowing. And um, thank you, Bill. And thank you, Dylan. My question, because I know there are a lot of them, is directed at Dylan. Um, it seems like, you know, what you're talking about is ethical documentation. Um, and my question is, as somebody who is making this, um, this database that has to be useful for other people, how do you determine what you leave out? Because I think, you know, the tendency to be inclusive would be an accumulation. And I'm wondering what kinds of things do you struggle with in determining what you leave out of your own cataloging? Uh, this is a really excellent question uh, because the, the tendency is to like these catalogers economize, catalog what you need and leave the rest and it's a project for another day. It's a really, it's been an interesting opportunity. I didn't begin my dissertation with an idea of what I was going to do. So I made this giant database um, of things without a purpose. I trusted that something would emerge by the sheer volume of material. Um, I don't know. I think by, by, my, by dint of my own personality flaws, I, I love the sort of um, the hunt and explorations. So I'm perfectly okay with things that I'm, I'm not going to touch and use um, because I like to include them because maybe I will change how I think someday. So I've replicated everything that existed prior to me. I've tried to put all of that information in there and grab onto it. And I've tried to do it in ways that tack back and forth between um, best practices, but also like my project is different and weird and I have to deal with difference and weirdness in my own case. So I don't think I've answered your question especially well, but that's, that's my thought process as I have gone through the sort of act of cataloging. Yeah, I think it's a good question because a lot of what you both are talking about are sort of what are the limitations that have been put upon a field, whether it's what's the definition of music or what's the definition of a, a modest Venus. So yeah, the question of how far you open it up, I think is a really important one in terms of how we all do our work. Um, I'm really going to move through these in the order they seem to be coming up. So Becky Levitan, I think you're next. Thank you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. So I have my questions for Dylan, but I just wanted to say to Bill, I feel so lucky and excited to, I think, have been present when the idea for your project kind of started firing or the cylinders started moving, the cogs started going. So that was really exciting and what a privilege. Um, and I'm really excited to, to participate in your installation. My question for Dylan, uh, it relates to Rebecca's. Um, I was gonna say your project doesn't seem like it's about modest Venus, but rather ontologies of modest Venus and what, what a time to be doing that when we're transitioning from things like LIMP into CDOC CRM and linked open data. So I, I kind of had a twofold question. The first is how useful is the notion of a type at all anymore? 
And the second is, if, if we say it is useful, uh, what new sorts of questions can you ask when, when data is linked rather than sequential? An interesting question. Um, I think that some parts of I think that some parts of taxonomic systems can be useful. I think that where the modest Venus falls apart is really the sort of the logic of cataloging. Um, I think the fact that it's specifically about naked women and people have lots of um, preoccupations about how they talk about naked women. I think that this is some of this is a specific flaw of this particular corpus and maybe not applicable to all cataloging. Um, I've been trying to think about modular ways of cataloging, and I think that some of the sort of linked open data actually lends itself to this. So images as composed of not of types um, that are sort of unitary, this model is a type, there are other types of bottles, but the individual aspects um, of images. So the way that gestures, for example, can function and have a, can have a sort of taxonomic function and make references, the way that garments um, and stances um, and iconography can do similar work, um, but we do not have, we don't have a way of accessing it. Um, and because we don't have a way of accessing, we don't have a way of cataloging it in the same way, we can't actually retrieve those records. This is a retrieval nightmare. Um, if you can't catalog something in a way that's explicit, frequently you can't find it, um, or it's a slog to try to find it. So uh, again, that's sort of where I'm at on this. So I think there are possibilities, but I think the 19th century version needs to be revised severely. Um, I think if I can, I think also it, it points to, again, another connection, which is the way technology shapes what we can and do and what we know, right? Because the printed catalog was this phenomenon that now the linked data completely invites us to rethink and the, the recording technology is, you know, so there's lots of ways in which you've touched on how technology is shaping what a, the way of thinking of your field, which I think is another interesting point of intersection. So thanks for that question, Becky. I think David or is it David or Brian? I don't know who is actually asking the question here. It's me. Uh... First of all, I just want to thank uh, both of you. Uh, these are really fantastic kind of in, insights into what it is that you both do um, sort of in terms of practice, as well as the content of what you do. And they're both really excellent um, uh, ways of helping us think about method and methodology. Um, and, and this is why I wanted to ask the question for both of you which is about repetition and pattern. Because it seems to me like one of the things that is going on, especially with you know, the, the, these Venuses is that over time, and this is part of your mandate to kind of figure out how to include them, there are these very interesting variations, permutations, repetitions of certain elements and that as you have, have shown Dylan get either uh, categorized or, or shaped by scholars, but that doesn't necessarily tell us much about what's going on in terms of the transmission of rep repetitive patterns uh, or types over time. And then for Bill, you know, the fact that you started us off, especially those of us who are, you know, so attuned to very conventional Western ways of hearing classical music that you kind of are asking us to disrupt how we approach re repetition and patterns, especially in something like Bach, to kind of get us, like to disorient us in order to get us to think about what is happening there. And so both of you are interested in how music uh, engages with patterns and repetition, but then even within your own practices, your own approaches to what it is that you are doing kind of interventions that you're making as, as scholars, you're also interested in disrupting patterns of repetition. So I'm just kind of curious how you both think about, in a way, kind of the, the, the kind of conventions of patterns that are have long precede you and probably will long post date you. Uh, and then what it is that you're doing to disrupt or disorient those, those, those patterns, both in terms of how you do it as scholars and artists and so forth, but also how it then translates back to the, the, the fields that you're contributing to. Maybe I can start because Dylan, yeah. 
Um, that's a massive question, David. Thank you for it. <laughs> um, yeah. So how to how to disrupt patterns of repetition? I mean, um, in music, uh, Western, in I say in music, in Western music, um, there, especially 18th century Western music and thinking, uh, which is still basically what is taught at most conservatories and universities throughout the United States and Western Europe. Um, there's this idea that um, performances, that, that performers are somehow getting to the core of a work when they're performing it, that there's some sort of, that if they're reaching for the original sonic imagination of the composer and like, you just you can listen to a piano roll recording of this famous German uh, pianist Karl Reinecke playing a Mozart piano sonata, and it's like herky jerky. It's from the late 1800s, and it's he's like speeding up and slowing down. He like slams on the brakes, and you listen to someone today play Mozart's same Mozart piano sonata, completely smooth, completely um, symmetrical, completely sort of like uh, homogenized. Um, and who's, I guess the reason I bring this up is to say that all of these things are cultural constructions. It's the, the way that we interpret music is based on the time, uh, based on the culture, based on our understanding of what the music is. And so my idea at least is like, if we fundamentally ask the question, well, what is the music? What is it that we are trying to recreate or create? Um, then somehow we can sort of move the tectonic plates to say, oh, right, we're performing a sort of thing that's so ingrained in us, a, a belief that we're somehow reaching towards a sort of uh, original sonic idea. And like in reality, we're performing our own creative sonic idea. Um, and the, the sooner we get to that, the sooner we can break free of sort of the binds the, that, that bind us in this, yeah. in this time. Uh, I mean, I, let's see, um, from where I stand, I see humans as pretty sophisticated um, and predisposed to pattern recognition. Humans love finding patterns and organizing information according to patterns. And it's not that those patterns aren't real, it's that they're partial <laughs> for me, for what I work on. That's one, one lens through which you can understand this. There was a way in which if we were all programmed to look for difference, we would tell different stories about the things that I work on, right? Um, we would be lunging for different explanations uh, and stories. Um, so in some ways, I'm trying to think about sort of best practices for pattern recognition, you know, what sort of questions to ask, where to go sort of, um, yeah, how to actually approach uh, and sort of use the skill that I think is super valuable and could be super powerful, um, but retrain it for other purposes and to look at other, ask other questions. So I'll continue thinking about that. Thank you, Jake. That's Great. I love how those answers can inform each other. Um, Anna, I think you are next. Great. Um, thank you for these two wonderful papers um, that spoke to each other in all kinds of beautiful ways. And I have a question for both of you um, about the kind of way that both of your work seems to like reinscribe the body. Um, and so the version of it for Dylan, I think is uh, surprised myself a little bit by asking you like quite an art historical question about, you know, like in the expansion of this set um, and with the kind of, I think we've, we've done a lot of kind of gesturing at the possibilities of like including all of these other kinds of bodies and like thinking about the full set of these like naked women's bodies that are like moving across this like vast geography. Um, and I wonder if you could maybe like speculate visually a little bit about like what it does to our idea of this type or of what those bodies look like to kind of, you know, have the Syrian stuff, to have the coins, to have like the bodies of the periphery somehow included. And then the version of it for Bill um, is about dance, I guess, and about the kind of, you know, these methods of like embodied intimate transmission, um, which feel to me so much uh, akin to the way that dance is transmitted in this like highly, 
you know, personal way that you learn a dance from somebody from your sort of encounter with their body in space. Um, and yeah, and whether that's sort of also part of how you're thinking about this kind of material transmission of sound and practice. So thank you, both of you. Uh, shall I? Um, let's see. Um, so I've been really interested throughout this entire project in scale and how that shapes the type of um, uh, ways that we relate to objects, the sort of over-determination of over life size and life size big marble statuary that sort of looks like people, I think has facilitated some of the like, um, I don't know, the, the over, the tendency of scholars to like tell me a little bit too much about their like internal erotic imaginaries when they encounter the statue, um, which, which is fascinating as a phenomenon, but I think that not so useful for understanding the sort of breadth and depth of the series as a, as a whole. Um, for instance, there are all these little hairpins that are like 3.5, um, I don't know, little centimeters. They're, they're, they're bitsy and probably buried in a nest of hair. Like is some sort of like, embodied sort of erotic experience, what you're getting out of, you know, something buried um, in a hair tower, like I, I, unclear to me. Um, so I think that in some ways, this it's a challenging exercise to try to think about the way that scale um, impacts visuality, how much attention we pay to things, the degree to which things are even visible, even though they may be well-wrought objects. Um, so, so I think a lot about that. Um, I have a couple of different scales in the dissertation, but I would love to sort of continue to sort of build on that and think about how that could be integrated uh, moving forward. And uh, thanks, Anna, for that great question. I was just talking with someone, I forget who it was, maybe you can raise your hand, about the affinities between exactly the things I'm talking about of like a intimate personal uh, connection uh, in music making and dance. Um, Anyway, um, yeah, I, I think there's there's um, amazing affinities there. Um, and I wonder, I mean, my sort of feeling for why it, it is like this in classical music and why it's not in dance, I, I, I very quickly go down the sort of commodification route and like 19th century ideas about removing objects from, you know, removing sound for making an object out of the sound. And um, I don't know, I think there's much to be learned, I guess, from from dance um, and choreographers and how it's like, really, you need to study with that person. Uh, but of course, it can't be commodified as easily. You can't sell it. How do you sell that? Um, so that's that's where I'll leave that. Although it, they, they do sell it. I mean, the interesting thing is that choreographers like do manage to, you can sell a dance to MoMA um, and the, like the mechanisms of doing that are like, Interesting. So we need to learn a little bit from the dancers, I guess. <laughs> Bill, when you were talking about this, your final, one of your final points about the transmission, Radig, is it Radig? It made me think about dance and how dance is communicated. I mean, I'm yeah. not a dancer, but it's something I've always wondered is how dances are recorded and transmitted. I wonder if there's a practice element. This is how Balanchine did it. This is now I'm doing it. You know, if there's something almost along the lines of oral traditions and oral or the sharing of oral narratives that's what i so anna your question just brought that thought back to my mind um matt ellis uh, thank you both um so my question is is for bill um you know i was really struck by your research and i think it's really fascinating and i was curious if um, either Radig or you are interested in the implications of sort of Radig's approach for thinking through sort of the way that Western culture has often denigrated oral orality, right, in favor of, of the written word. And so if you're thinking about implications beyond music, but at the same time, I'm also thinking about jazz, right, and the history of jazz's reception, right? You know, I guess eventually in the 70s or so in the 80s, and onward, jazz is canonized, is taken to be an intellectual art form. But of course, for decades, it wasn't. You know, jazz is community-based. It's meant to be danced to. It's oral, the way that a lot of jazz musicians early on learn is through hearing, right? And through just listening and, and not focusing on, on the, the written tradition, right? And of course, the way that jazz was denigrated in America for decades has 
uh, a lot less to do with the music per se and a lot more to do about other things, the subtext, right? Race, con uh, conceptions of, of culture and very strong and outmoded attitudes about different ways of knowing. So I was, I, I'm wondering if you could, I guess, both speak to jazz in particular, but also the implications for Radik's approach beyond jazz, thinking about or, um, orality versus textuality and the way that these have been treated in the academic canon. So there, there are tons of connections. Thanks, Matt, for that question. There are tons of questions to be made uh, between improvised music traditions and Elian Radig's, uh, but also jazz. Um, uh, and yeah, this, this idea, it's like, where does the jazz live? Does it live in the recording? And I think very much like our conception of jazz is like, yeah, it lives in the recording. That's where that's where it is. And of course that raises a lot of questions about, well, is that really where it lives? Or was it the community of people who came together in the, in the way of thinking and the processes of making that were the music or are the music, let's say. Um, Eliane Radig, uh, interestingly, there's a uh, interview with her where she's asked, uh, so this like oral tradition thing, it's so like hip and so cool, you're so innovative. And she's like, whoa, 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 pump the brakes. Most things are oral traditions, like throughout all of history. Like, it's just weird that Western music is not. And so like, I, she's like, I don't see myself as being some sort of innovator. I'm doing a thing that everybody does um, and has done for forever. So she sees herself very much like, um, I, I try to paint her in this light of like, she's like a, you know, a, a fighter, like resisting all this stuff. And she's like, no, I'm just doing, I'm just doing what everybody does. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not trying to push back against anything. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Great, thanks. Um, Maggie Popkin. Hi, uh, thank you both so much for those talks. Um, so I, I'll maybe start with you because I, to follow up on Matt's question, I sort of had um, the opposite reaction to when you were talking about Eliane Radig and, this idea, you know, we, I think generally we think of sort of oral traditions as more dispersed or popular than literary traditions, which restrict knowledge. But maybe I misheard you correctly, uh, or heard you incorrectly. It sounded like there's only been sort of 20 performers who've sort of gone through the process of learning how to, you know, sit and drink tea and have these intimate bonds and learn how to the material of this music. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how this idea of the material of music being community formation or you know, being in these communities um, carries, how, how, that, how that plays with the idea of exclusion and who gets to be part of this community and how and sort of the accessibility of the music and its material. And that made me think of that. And then also this awesome project that you're doing for the Villa Chiara, I know you've been thinking about how to make it linguistic, you know, linguistically accessible to people who speak different languages. And I know there's, you know, like stairs going up to the HUD and it's not wheelchair accessible. So on all these different levels, if you could maybe talk a little bit about how you see exclusion and accessibility playing into this idea of community. Yeah, so this is a, that's a great question. And it's uh, something I bring up in my dissertation talking about, you know, this is quite an exclusive community in the end because it's all based off of, you know, someone calls up someone else and says, you know, I think you should work with Elian. Here's her number, you should give her a call. That's how most people got in touch with her, especially in the earlier years when she first started um, writing for instrumentalists. So yeah, it's remarkably exclusive in that way. Um, but I wonder to have a community, I wonder if there's a friction there between community and exclusion or inclusion. That in order to have a group of people with shared affinities, it means that you have a group of people with shared affinities. It's like you, 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 you are necessarily not everyone. And I don't think that Eliane Radig's goal was to be inclusive. I don't think that she was trying to create a music where everyone could be involved. She wanted to make the music she wanted to make. And it just so happens that she created this rich network of performers who sort of float around her um, and are connected through all these different scenes and different things and they come together with her. And so um, I'm not sure, yeah. So, so, there's, so there's that. Um, uh, with the Villa, Villa Shara, um, yeah, I am thinking about how to make it accessible to everyone. The whole idea of it is to have a space outside of this castle that we're in atop this hill that people can interact with the sounds that 
of other people and the sounds of our community somehow? How do we reach outside of these walls? Um, and also to make a cultivate a space where people can interact with one another to facilitate uh, versus telling or instructing or like handing or here's this thing, recreate it. Um, so yeah, these are the things I'm thinking about um, with the Villa Shara um, to be continued, I guess. Definitely. I know we all want to come participate in that. Avi Noam, I think you're next. Thank you. Thank you both. It was uh, very inspiring and uh, great to hear these two talks and I enjoyed them very much. I have two questions. I'm trying to do it quickly. Uh, the first one is to um, <clears throat> To Dylan, and they, I don't have to tell you, Dylan, that they you are you are just stepping on the uh, basis of art history and especially the German tradition that uh, started from typology and uh, move into the history of style, into iconography, the history of the image. So it seems that the, even the Germans, with all the crimes that they did to art history by creating a uh, a strong uh, um, modes of, of, of approaching art um, and the visual, uh, they were trying themselves to, to find the salvation. Uh, you know, the moment you do discover style, you could speak about evolution, you could speak about Kunstwoll and you, you bring time into it. The moment you start to look at other um, salvation project like iconography, you could bring the word into it. So they are trying to revive the rigid uh, uh, typology that you have shown. Um, do you have, I'm, I'm asking you like the redeemer, what is your salvation? Where is the, the point where you could, you know, speak about the salvation uh, that you can, uh, um, you know, suggest to us in, in your project, uh, uh, which might fall very quickly into typology of any type. Um, and the second question is, is to Bill, I enjoy also your talk. I mean, what I felt that was amazingly interesting also for the community here, that you open the movement between different fields so clear. I mean, the fact that you call it the materiality of sounds is, is exactly, you know, if I would say the sound of painting uh, from the other side or the sound of materials uh, from the other side, I could speak about that, which is no less important and objects were made to be sound until today we are just, you know, knocking on wood. I mean, it's, 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 it has a whole, uh, um, power uh, to move in, in both directions. So I, I just, it's just a thank you for doing this interdisciplinary movement between material and sound and, and, and sound and material that we can think in both ways. Thank you. I don't know if Dylan want to, to be a redeemer or you know. Sure. Um, I, 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 I deny any sort of redeemer-like qualities. I think um, I started off this project very pessimistic. So maybe I'll talk about the thing that has made me optimistic in my project, um, which is that classics has um, a, a strong rhetoric of sort of scarcity. There are all of these things that don't survive, that we don't know, that we wish we had. Um, and we have this profound nostalgia for this world. Um, I think the one thing my project has shown me is that there's a ton of stuff that is around, that is still here. It's super weird, it's super colorful, and we don't do anything <laughs> with it. There are people's names. We can be super specific about some of these things. And if, if we use some approaches that are um, treating this as legacy data and, and we can move across sort of scales um, of phenomenon, um, we can reconstruct a lot of the archaeological context that has been destroyed for some of these things. Um, I've done this in one case, and I think that there's promise there um, for other ways of doing sort of classical art history, classical archaeological things that let us get down into like people's lives and the way that these things are sort of dynamic and interesting and meaningful and are not about all the stuff that we wish we had that we don't. So I think that's the one thing I, my project does find to be optimistic about. Um, this material or this approach. Yeah. 
Bill, did you want to respond? Uh, thank, thank you. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, Bill, so I will add, I mean, there is something else maybe that uh, you can refer to, you know, in art history, there is also a big notion now of looking at the tools that were made for making the art objects and even molds. So the moment we speak about a mold to make a replica and so on, we are coming to your VAX uh, uh, cylindrical uh, um, uh, recorder that, that you are talking about. So in art history, you would talk about the, the um, histories of becoming, uh, as if we are trying to create a duration now of the process of, um, is it something that you could work with or is it something that I'm shooting too long to what no, I think I think that's great. Um, I don't know what what shape it takes is the problem. It's like how do you document becoming? I mean, it's the it's what you're talking about. Like no one, I mean, <laughs> how do you document that? How do you make that an experience that other people can witness or experience? I think um, in like doing this thing that I'm doing in the Villa Shara, I think that's halfway there. That in a way, people are doing the process of their becoming. Like they are doing it and being involved in it, like they're experiencing it in singing a song from their memory that brings them joy that is captured in a moment. And then interacting with their ears with someone else who also did that. Um, uh, there's, I, I left this out, but there's also gonna be a website. They're gonna be automatically uploaded to the website. There's gonna be a QR code where they can scan and go to the website and listen to all of the, all of the songs of that have been happened so far. Um, so there's kind of a way it's like, <laughs> I'm performing the thing that I'm critical of, but I'm trying to facilitate some sort of community in it. Um, so it's, yeah, art's not a science. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. I think we have time for one more question. Ooh, Robert, would you like to? Yes, thank you so much. Um, Thanks, thanks to both of you for your, your presentations. They, um, I think, sparked in me like a, a lot of um, thoughts and questions about representation. And I think just because in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, point my, my question to, to Dylan. Um, and there's a little bit of a preamble. And I just have to apologize that it'll sound like one of those questions that isn't a question until it is. But it, there is a question at the end. But I want to frame it accurately. So. Um, from just from my, my background, which considers some things in uh, the natural sciences, um, I, I found your, your focus on taxonomy really exciting. And it reminded me of a few things uh, just from my field, uh, specifically the way the botanists worked and uh, how in um, the 1800s, uh, Linnaeus's classification was of course highly popular for, for looking at botanical, uh, you know, was a botanical system, but its organization, the hierarchy that it proposed also matched the hierarchy of cognition that Kant proposed in his uh, Stufenlieder. And what happened with that is that the model of how the natural world was organized and the model for how we could understand the natural world were uh, both organized similarly and therefore they seemed to be in correspondence. If you jump ahead to the 1950s, there was a movement in natural scientists called uh, in natural science called the new systematics, where these scientists said um, this model of taxonomy might not be uh, naturally accurate, but it is at least useful. And so they then use the systematics models from the natural sciences to address all sorts of other things. And um, I see in your work a way of almost compressing that whole history um, with a new model of classification. So from what I understand that you're doing, uh, it's, it has an interest in a flat ontology. And that uh, sort of brought up in my mind um, other thinkers of flat ontology right now, people like Bruno Latour and his colleagues. And I'm just, I'm wondering if we could sort of take that whole template in your work and ask from your case study of working this way with flat ontologies, could you somehow become an advocate for a model of representing uh, different domains of knowledge that you say that from the standpoint of art history, we have found these things, they're not natural of course, because they're classifying a set of um, artifacts that have um, 
their, their own histories that are related to culture. But from what I found from this research, I'm arguing that we use this method of approach for all sorts of domains of knowledge that might suffer from similar political or cultural assumptions. Um, is there a way for you that you um, feel that your project could reach more broadly into systems of knowledge outside of your specific domain of interest? It's a really interesting question. Um, it's one that I've been thinking about because I had a prior life as a biology nerd. So my original question was, like, what is the relationship to cladistics? Like, I really want to know, like, in what way <laughs> these things are similar. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that this comes back to some of the pattern recognition things that I've talked about earlier. Um, and I think that it comes down to other things that I've been talking about, too, about the ways in which there are sort of networks that underlie all of these observations. So like the museum things that I talked about earlier, the way that the rich get richer, those um, same couple of images sort of attract everything into this. It's like a well-known part of network analysis, small world theory. Like this is something that we understand. So it'd be interesting to try to make some of these different conversations speak to each other. How, how we do that, I don't know. My, my little corner of the world feels very sort of parochial. Nobody really cares about these things, not even classical art historians. So um, it would be interesting to try to figure out how to, how to pitch and reframe this idea for other, for other audiences as a case study or um, sort of alongside other types of things. Um, I like a challenge, so we shall see. I'll get to be thinking about that, thank you. Dylan, I think these questions prove that it's not so niche. It's actually, there's a lot of resonance with a lot of work that many people are doing. Um, those are excellent questions following really great papers and presentations. So I, I want to thank you all. And to quote my colleague, Lynn Lancaster, Bon appetito. <laughs> Good night, everyone.